Well, hello everyone and welcome to our 2022 Jean Jacobs Lecture Series. I'm Maria McDonald, Executive Director of the Center for the Living City. And with me behind the scenes, we have Chelsea Gauthier, the Associate Director from the Center. This lecture is being brought to you um, by the AIA Northeastern Pennsylvania and the Center for the Living City and Marywood University School of Architecture. Today, our talk is on expanding the field of architecture, women in practice across the globe. We have with us Marcia Feuerstein, Jody Leco, and Pella Zellner Bassett, co-authors of the forthcoming book, Expanding the Field of Architecture, Women in Practice Across the Globe, <clears throat> excuse me, in which they portray 40 beautiful and diverse architectural projects. For this presentation and discussion, they will showcase several of these award-winning urban interventions. So I have the honor to introduce to you each of our speakers, and we'll start with Marcia. Marcia Feuerstein is an architect and professor exploring architecture through body, embodiment, performance, theater, and reuse by investigating these links within theory and practice through books, essays, installations, and design projects. She has practiced architecture in New York City, Buffalo, Philadelphia, and the DC area. Marcia's publications include contributions to journals and edited volumes, Rutledge Companion to Drawings and Models in Press, Stealings and Dreams, Body and Building, Architecture as Performing Art and Changing Places. An Associate Professor at Virginia Tech's School of Architecture and Design at the Washington Alexandria Architecture Center, she received a PhD and an MS in architecture from the University of Pennsylvania, a Master of Architecture from the University at Buffalo, and a Bachelor of Science from Tufts University. Welcome, Marcia. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Thank you. Next, we have Jody Lacoe. Jody is an architect teaching at Marywood University in Scranton, Pennsylvania, the birthplace of Jane Butzner Jacobs whose work inspired her students to win first prize in the attached housing division of the 2021 U.S. Solar Decathlon Design Challenge with Electric Jane, affordable net zero energy homes. With a dissertation exploring the synesthetic perception of spatial relationships, she earned a PhD in architecture and design research from Washington Alexandria Architecture Center an urban extension of Virginia Tech's School of Architecture and Design. Her recent and forthcoming publications are included in Ceilings and Dreams, The Architecture of Love, Theories of Architectural Imagination and Remote Practices, Architecture in Proximity. Cody, welcome to our lecture today. Thank you. Pella, Pella graduated from University de Buenos Aires and practiced architecture in Argentina and Uruguay. She obtained a master's degree from SciArc, practiced in Los Angeles with Norman R. Miller Architects, and together with Jim Bassett, started Zellner Bassett. She is currently an associate professor at Virginia Tech and director of the International Archive of Women in Architecture, IAWA. Her creative work with the IAWA includes the installation 30 by 30 shown internationally for which she received the 2018-19 ACSA Creative Achievement Award. Her scholarship has been published in Museum Making, Narratives, Architectures, Exhibition, The Proceedings of, Association, of the Association of Schools of Architecture and Bitacora Architecture, number 33. Pella, thank you so much for being here. We're so excited to have all three of you and see this amazing adventure. I know this has been several years in the making and we are so grateful to have you with us to share all of these exciting projects. So Pella, you're going to go first and I'm going to disappear. We do encourage all of you to please, as the three women are talking to put all of your questions into the Q&A and we'll collect them. And at the end of our of their talk, we'll, I'll come back on and we'll, we'll answer some of your questions. So it's going to go about 45 minutes to 50 minutes and let you take it from here. Can we? Thank you. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
There we go. Everyone can hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. Okay, good. So thank you so much, Maria. And thank you to the Center for the Living City for inviting us to lecture today. And thank you to everyone who is joining us on Zoom. So during this month in the US, UK and Australia, among other places, we are celebrating Women's History Month by recognizing women's historical and contemporary contributions. In 2016, the three of us envisioned a book that would be a collection of 40 projects that happened to be designed by women, just like for about 2000 years, they included projects primarily by men. And although simply stated, the situation proved to be much more complex than anticipate, anticipated. It was entangled with the collaborative nature of creative practice itself. Unlike in popular cultural portrayals, there is no singular, single visionary who is solely responsible for architectural projects. We all know this. Architecture is created by teams of architects, designers, engineers, and contractors, as well as clients, accountants, lawyers, and even community members. Every architectural practice is modeled on collaboration, whether it's a small firm consulting with other companies or large firms with in-house interdisciplinary teams. While women have joined the profession in larger numbers in the last two decades, they account for less than one quarter of registered architects in the United States of America. Elsewhere in the world and in leadership positions, these numbers are even lower. <clears throat> According to a survey of the top 100 international architecture firms published by Dezine in 2017, only one in 10 top only one in 10 of top leadership positions are held by women. Danish architect Dorte Mandrup described the findings as quite shocking, adding that, quote, it's interesting too, that there seemed to be practically no woman holding creative director or lead designer position. And that the women that are top positions have administrative or CEO roles backing up a male star. While the number of women in architecture is improving, it is far from equal and prejudices still find their way into commissions, awards, and public recognition. In the field of architecture, recognition, credit, and attrition in the press, publications, and awards has traditionally stemmed from the idea of the sole visionary, the modern master architect. This situation is eloquently described by Italian architect Doriana Mandrelli Fuxas founder of Studio Fuxas with her husband, Massimilia, Massimiliano. We work together, we sign our names together on projects, but often in the end, my name doesn't appear, even when I was 90% responsible for the projects. When two individuals work on a project and one of them is well-known, that's enough for people. Two people is one too many. This erasure is most evident in the controversy surrounding the highest awards in the field of architecture the Pritzker Architecture Prize, awarded annually to honor a living architect or architects whose built work demonstrates a combination of those qualities of talent, vision, and commitment, which has produced consistent and significant contributions to humanity and the built environment through the art of architecture. First awarded in 1979, it wasn't until 2001 that this award transitioned from recognizing one person to embracing partnerships with laureates Jacques Herzog and Pierre de Moron. A decade earlier, the idea of awarding partners was rejected when Robert Venturi received the Pritzker Architecture Prize without his partner, Denise Scott Brown, although the two practiced professionally and collaboratively since 1967. Ironically, two years before Venturi became a laureate, Scott Brown published her influential essay, Room at the Top, Sexism and the Star System in Architecture in which she criticized the range and role of sexism in the attribution of her work to her partner alone. In 2004, Iraqi-born architect Zaha Hadid was the first woman, woman to win the Pritzker Prize, and she remains the only sole female recipient. 
radical and theoretical Hadid's position within a cult of egoistic personalities was defined by the critics as idiosyncratic, since as Scott Brown noted, the architectural prima donnas are all male. While the quality of Hadid's work recogni was recognized by her male peers, her penchant for curvilinear forms was generally interpreted as female, as she was dubbed queen of the curve by the Guardian critic Rowan Moore. Underlining this point a little over one month later, critic Oliver Wainwright's headline in the Guardian read, quote, Zaha Hadid's sports stadiums, too big, too expensive, too much like a vagina. Seeking to avoid similar stereotypes, Mandrop stated definitively in response again to the 2017 Dazine survey that I'm not a female architect, I am an architect, decrying the lists that she believes place women in tenuous positions as other, somehow different from their male counterparts. Admittedly, Mandrop is neither wrong nor alone in this sentiment, and she has refused to have her work in books and articles that call out women designers, including this book. However, unless the contributions of women are explicitly recognized, great architecture is generally assumed by critics and the public alike to have been designed by men. Our intention in writing the book is to recognize the greatness of the work itself and of those who contributed to the work. We selected projects from across the globe to reveal the abundant and diverse built work led in myriad ways by women architects and designers without dwelling on the idea of female or the feminine. Just as for centuries, similar books contain projects that happen to have been designed by men, we hold the position that this is a collection of 40 projects that happen to have been designed by women, albeit collaborative. Through our conversations with the designers, we were able to de demonstrate unique qualities of their works that reveal their design intentions that are evident in the beauty of the projects themselves. Through this range, and we selected nine projects for today, we hope to recognize the diverse roles of women architects and designers in producing great buildings and to contribute to the global effort of normalizing women in leadership roles in the expanding field of architecture. And Paula is going to present the very, the first project and then we'll continue from there. Okay. Thank you. So the first uh, project is the Centro Cultural Elena Garro. Elena Garro Cultural Center in Coyoacan, Mexico, designed by Fernanda Canales Arquitectura in collaboration with Arquitectura 911. The municipality of Coyoacan in the southern area of Mexico City can be distinguished for its complex history since its settlement around the 11th century. The birthplace of artist Frida Kahlo, Coyoacan maintains in spite of its vibrant cultural activity an intimate scale of two-story single-family homes built between the 16th and the 20th century. The dense urban fabric is defined by narrow cobblestone roads and small plazas filled with mature trees, urban remnants of the colonial period. The Elena Garro Cultural Center is named after Elena Garro, a prolific Mexican screenwriter, journalist, playwright, storyteller, novelist, and activist of the early 20th century, and is situated in a neighborhood long considered an artist's enclave. In this historical context, the project repurposes an existing mansion built at the turn of the century and expands it to house a bookstore, classrooms, multipurpose auditorium, an outdoor forum, a cafeteria, and offices. Embedded in a dense urban two-story neighborhood where the public space of the street is firmly held by the continuous facade. Uh, sorry, Jody, go back one. Back. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Now mm -hmm. go. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Embedded in a dense urban two story neighborhood <laughs> where the public space of the street is firmly held by the continuous facade of the city block built on the property line. The project elects to recede from the street to create a public pocket, a moment of arrival. Sorry. A raised landscape shifts the, point, the points of entrance, now originating at the corners of the property rather than on the central axis of the lot, 
offering deeper perspectives and allowing a longer and slower sequence of arrival and entrance via a ramp. The project occupies, in addition to the existing mansion, the front and the backyard. The double height volume added in front of the mansion is conceived as an urban scale vitrine, allowing the books to spill out toward the street. The volume at the back housing the cultural center activities occupies the full width of the lot, giving the outdoor spaces a finished form. The simple and neutral materials introduced are left exposed in honor, honest expression and in deference to the mansion. In addition to displaying the books, the urban vitrine in the front frames the front facade of the existing mansion with its theatrical balcony projecting over the porch into the center of the new volume and encases the front yard with its already existing vegetation and mature trees. Like a glove turned inside out, the front volume frames and exhibits the mansion as an historic artifact inviting the visitor to inhabit and experience it now with raised awareness from multiple perspectives. With its double height glass facade, the urban vitrine draws the public space and landscape of the street in, while the roof aperture captures the sky to offer it to the mature trees growing through it. Referencing the small urban patios and courtyards typical of this area, the expansion acts as an instrument that mediates the landscape delineating outdoor spaces, providing buffer spaces and small courtyards, and employing subtle reveals that without crowding the mansion, gently invite it to contribute to the overall experience. Contiguous to the cafe, a courtyard offers a contained quiet outdoor space that acts as a transition between the bookstore and the lively outdoor forum and gardens. In the density of the urban context and the constraining limits of the lot, the design tripling its original built volume, successfully conveys expansiveness by formalizing the exterior, incorporating gardens, courtyards, a roof garden, making room for spaces of contemplation, learning, and discourse, a fitting homage to Elena Garro. Now, the Writers' Theater was founded in Glencoe in 1992, with a special emphasis on exploring the power of the written word within the intimacy of theater. From its origins in the small back room of a local bookstore, a close relationship between the actors and their audience became a hallmark of this critically acclaimed company. In 2016, the Writers Theater welcomed audiences in its, to its new multi-theater complex designed by Studio Gang on the former site of the Women's Library Club of Glencoe. Although located on the Metro line, the Metro Regional Rail Line of North Chicago, the forest preserve area of Cook County has provided a natural barrier to the sprawling development of Chicago, preserving a small town atmosphere. The Writers Theater and the Women's Library Club share this new building on Tudor Court, a commercial street with small restaurants and cafes between a contained civic and retail core and large historic houses with ample front lawns on mature tree-lined streets. On either side of the theater, there are two park spaces, an informal grove of trees on the east side, creating a visual and acoustic buffer to vehicles on Green Bay Road and the Metro tracks beyond, and Friends Park to the west, which faces Vernon Avenue and includes a children's playground within its context. The design for the Writers' Theater opens up itself up to the surrounding parks and to the street life, a goal that Jeannie Gang linked to her desire to explore the, quote, connection between theater and urban life. The choice to wrap the two formal theater spaces one, a 250-seat thrust stage theater, and the second, a 99-seat black box, with light-filled, visually permeable spaces, allows the company to integrate itself into the life of the village, inviting curiosity from children and passersby. Highly visible due to its glass facade facing Tudor Court and the adjacent grove of trees, the lobby serves as a third informal performance or presentation space, 
That is used both by the theater and the community at large. In pleasant weather, Two of the large glass panels facing onto the grove can be opened, extending the lobby into the park and thereby fulfilling its relationship with urban life. This sense of permeability is heightened by the upper level open air gallery walk that overlooks the lobby, the park, the street and the pedestrian spaces below. Maintaining the sense of openness and permeability between the building and its surroundings Four large timber trusses are supported on four columns, allowing for an open floor plan. And the coffered roof framing, also made of laminated timber, sits atop the trusses. The gallery walk is suspended from this primary structure. Its timber lattice is physically and visually light, akin to the branches of the tree canopy beyond, and in contrast to the great trusses composed of thin battens of Port Orford cedar, prized among native, native tribes in the Pacific Northwest to create stiff and straight arrow shafts. This seemingly delicate screen is actually a robust structural system that carries the walkway in tension. The battens meet the lower beams via a connection that leverages the natural strength and flexibility of this wood. Each batten is splayed and shimmed into a flared cat's paw that slots and locks into a matching pocket cut into the beam. From the vantage point of this timber perch, our patrons are immersed both in the surrounding tree canopy and the urban vitality of the theater and the street below. Now moving to Morocco. <laughs> At the end of the 8th century, Idris I founded Madinat Fas on the right bank of the Fez River within the far Maghreb region of North Africa in what is today within the Kingdom of Morocco. According to legend, Idris created the lines of the city using a golden pickaxe or fas, presumably tracing the first perimeter walls, principal streets, and the river fed canal system that are similar to the canals of his homeland in Baghdad, providing both fresh water and waste removal. Two decades later, his son Idris II founded a separate settlement named Al Alia on the left bank of the Fez River, populated by refugees from Al Karawin, now in the Republic of Tunisia, sort of middle Maghreb. In the middle of the ninth century, daughters of al karawan refugee, Muhammad al-Firi, used their inheritance to build mosques on either side of the Fez. In al Alia, Fatima funded and oversaw the construction herself of the mosque of the Karawin, which eventually became the University of al Karawin in 1963. Today, the al Firri mosques stand among the few remaining examples of Idrisid architecture in the pedestrian only streets of the Medina de Fes. 200 years after the founding of these two settlements, the Almoravids greatly expanded and strengthened the existing canal system, providing fresh water to every important building such as the al Fifri mosques and many other residences as well. However, after centuries of excessive pollution, the river canal system had become a sewer, almost entirely buried below ground. Previously praised as the river of jewels, the main canal of the Fez River, geographically the lowest point in the old city, became known as the river of trash until a separate sewer system was conducted, constructed in 2007. With these measures in place, Aziza Chiluni and Ta Takako Tejima, partners in Bureau East, proposed to uncover the main channel and excavate the riverbed to recreate the riparian wetlands of the Fez, also establishing several new public plazas providing relief in the congested streets. 
The mosque of the Kedawin had been renovated many times and expanded to encompass half a hectare, reportedly once capable of sheltering 20,000 worshipers in a Tipa style prayer hall. In 1349, a formal reading room for the Al Kadawin Library was constructed in the northeast corner of the mosque, and another reading room was later constructed south of the main prayer hall, accessed through a small door to the east of the mihrab, a semicircular niche in the Qibla wall used to orient worshipers in the direction of the Kaaba in Mecca. A 20th century renovation and expansion of the library now houses around 24,000 books, 6,000 lithographs, and over 4,000 manuscripts held behind a set of copper covered timber doors with four separate locks opened by four unique keys, each held by a different person. In 2012, Aziza Chauni Projects was selected to rehabilitate the library with three related objectives. To maintain the archival quality, interior temperature and humidity levels powered by on-site renewable energy sources, to provide a scientific laboratory for the preservation and digitization of fragile manuscripts and printed books, and to display these treasures to the general public. Alleviating an unpleasant and destructive dampness, Chaoni created a new canal system, repairing and replacing the broken clay pipes that allowed rainwater and the Uad Fez, or the Fez River, to freely flow beneath, beneath the library rooms. With a functioning drainage system in place, constant year-round temperature and humidity levels in the manuscript rooms were, were ensured with the aid of air conditioning units hidden behind new hand-carved wooden screens created by local artisans and powered by discreetly positioned photovoltaic panels. The space below the main reading room was transformed into a state-of-the-art laboratory to preserve digitally, preserve and digitally photograph these fragile artifacts. Opening this incredible cultural resource to the public was personal to Chawani who as a child growing up in Fez, recalls stories of her great grandfather finding respite in the secluded library while attending the University of Al-Karouin. A new courtyard cafe, a manuscript exhibition room, and a small museum now welcome and sustain the curiosity of all guests. These measures serve to protect and restore both the architecture and the contents of the library for current and future generations who seek to understand this area's history. Now <clears throat> we're gonna move to Spain. Uh, we're gonna look at the Caixa Forum Museum, Auditorium and Cultural Center in Zaragoza, Spain by Estudio Carme Pinos. Located on the former site of the railway station Al Portillo, and bordering the walled old city, city center of Zaragoza, the building anchors a large vacated piece of land newly designated by the city council as an urban park. In close proximity to Portillo's gate and the mid, in, into the medieval city, the project becomes a landmark in the company of, among others, the Bullring Plaza de Toros de la Misericordia, built in the late 1700s, and the Aljaferia Palace, currently the seat of parliament and one of the few remaining examples of Aragonese Mudejar art, built in the 11th century and protected by UNESCO. In response, the architecture is conceived as an object building, easily distinguishing itself with its sculptural form and scale, and clearly marking the entrance to the park. Based on a simple symmetrical diagram composed of two dissimilar squares intersecting diagonally, the volumetric organization of the architecture is easily read and comprehended in the cityscape. However, this diagonal shift and openness produce an unexpected spatial complexity that invites exploration and enriches the visitor's experience. The two large scale volumes are lifted and cantilever out into the public space from a central support composed of two robust black concrete walls supporting opposite corners of the intersecting volumes. Reaching up with a desire to contribute to the city skyline, the architecture performs as a flowing vertical city walk. 
The civic program includes an auditorium below ground, three exhibit halls, multi-purpose rooms and workshops above ground in the cantilevering masses, and a cafe restaurant on the rooftop. The architecture affords not only a continuous and fluid experience through its interior space, but also multiple opportunities along the way to reconnect with the city. Thriving in the semi-arid climate, the large screen clad volumes lift to create generous covered public spaces below. Visitors exiting the exhibit halls at different levels encounter views toward the city framed by these volumes and protected from glare. At the top, the roof of the hall offers an extensive terrace from which to enjoy the views of the meandering Ebro River and long vistas of the city. The covered public square to the south below the largest volume is three stories tall and is populated by smaller sensuous architectural fragments. You need to move ahead. Sorry, oh, but I think it's, there's some delay. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll continue. Uh, the covered public square to the south below the largest volume is three stories tall and is populated by smaller sensuous architectural fragments that acknowledge the human scale and invite visitors to use the space. Experienced simultaneously from multiple levels, the shaded square follows a design that turns the main entrance area into a multi-story park, a lively outdoor event space. The double skin metal facade wraps, wraps the volumes like a fabric on all exposed faces, both vertical and horizontal strengthening the reading of the lifted masses and formalizing the finished ceiling of the public spaces below them. The modular skin conceals the interior except for two pairs of large scale openings converging each at the outermost edges of the volumes, conferring on them the appearance of cubist faces scanning the horizon. Their elevation allows for broader vistas of the city over the open park and toward the main street. Mostly of aluminum, the double skin also incorporates translucent polycarbonate shapes that allow the blue LED luminaries installed in the cavity to shine through, turning the volumes into lanterns that illuminate and activate the public spaces below. This building has been recognized for its sustainability. It has also been lauded for what it offers the city for its public spaces as expressed by the architect spaces which allow for an urban coexistence with a building where creativity and cultural gatherings in a broad and democratic sense are possible. Um, moving to Budapest, we're gonna be looking at the Central European University um, by uh, O'Donnell and Toomey. Um, it, it was first imagined in 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall and communism, but it was officially founded as an international university in 1991, when the Eastern Bloc transformed to democracies and open societies. Their master plan consolidated a group of five existing historic adjacent university buildings to create an academic community that engendered engagement and interaction according to CEU's principles of openness and permeability. The campus connects to its neighborhood, the river and the city at large. Academic uh, clusters are interspersed with a series of covered yet open courtyards and internal streets, interweaving the buildings with new and existing public spaces, a characteristic of Budapest's rich and dense urban context. After the first phase of the master plan was completed, um, the campus was inaugurated with plans to complete the master plan, which you can see up on the left, which is the complete master plan. Um, but it was closed in 2019 by Viktor Orban, Hungary's far right prime minister. Um, the original campus of the new project, which was part of a UNESCO World Heritage Site in central Budapest, included five separate historic buildings connected by this new hidden architectural spine made up of pedestrian streets, courtyards, and atriums, which once inserted created a new building on Nadora Utka. The new building included access to the new library, uh, learning commons, multi-purpose auditorium, conference facilities, a new business school and teaching spaces. A true infill, 
the spine unfolds as a series of sequential interlocked multi-story spaces, voids open to views from the library, into the atrium, from the top of the stairs, out to the sky and roof gardens, promoting gathering uh, within the climate controlled space and protection from Budapest's harsh winters. Flying staircases, elegant steel sculptural elements within these spaces are connective wayfinding devices that create social spaces while encouraging interaction and collaboration between academic departments. The sequencing, transitions, and wayfinding events within the new public street and courtyards are framed by these in inserted stairs that vertically connect the, co uh, connect the complex and across the entire building, imparting a sense of lightness throughout the connected open forum spaces. The roof garden straddles the buildings, providing views over Budapest skylines. Skyline. Um, gardens are densely landscaped, creating environmental and sustainable models for the city, supporting native species, pollinators, and other natural environmental processes with community garden, green walls, and roofs, trellises, and open spaces for study, yoga, films, concerts, socializing, and education. Rainwater collection supplies the drip irrigation system water efficient toilets and faucets. The gardens reduce heat gain, filter air, and create shade to the inner courts. CEU's new facade and main entrance is located on access with the Danube River intersecting with the larger city and inviting citizens and students to enter to use a library and cafe. The entrance also establishes an exterior public gathering space on the street and as, first, and as the first contemporary construction to be built within this historically protected area, it was designed to maintain the street edge, address the vis existing scale and proportional system of neighboring facades, and retain, the exist and retain the existing plot size and building heights. Facades study models and watercolors by the, by the architects explored the architectural integrity of the street along Nador while facing towards the Danube. Clad in local limestone used throughout the city, it, contain, it contrasts with neighboring facades while alluding to the, his, the city's historic stone architecture. The geometric and cubic facades are solid yet open. Internal public spaces are fabricated with stone, timber, concrete, and steel. Um, the new construction seamlessly fits within the existing historic fabric while retaining its contemporary presence. Now we are moving to Denmark. <laughs> Established in the early eighth century on the west coast of Southern Jylland, Ripa, Ripa was an important medieval Danish trading town along the Ripe River, which flows westerly into the frigid waters of the North Sea. In excavations completed by the Southwest Jutland Museums in 2012, Across the plaza from Ripa's main cathedral, a brick ruin of a 12th century monastery was discovered near more than 70 Christian Viking graves in a cemetery believed to have been established by Ansgar, the 9th century Archbishop of Hamburg Bremen. Originally, Ansgar's church and cemetery were established away from the city center, positioned south of the river. But over time, with the erection of the cathedral, the plaza became a very important public place on which other civic structures were built. Originally built on top of the cemetery, the south and east wings of the procession hall were demolished in 1738 to supply bricks for the rebuilding and expansion of the cathedral. The remaining north wing was kept and served many functions over the years, related and unrelated to the church. Today, the hall provides access to the site of Ansgar Cemetery and the ruins of the refectory, enclosed by glass walls and protected under the parish house. Designed by Lundgaard and Trenberg Architecture with landscape architects Sean Hare, the parish house playfully interprets the gable roofs of neighboring longhouse brick buildings. Rather than using standard bricks and half round roof tiles, the designers created large handcrafted clay tiles that seamlessly clad the roof and upper exterior walls, unifying the steeply gabled form. The long side of which faces the brick facade of the south aisle of the cathedral. 
This sensitivity to the architectural context is reflected in partner Lene Tranberg's description of the firm's approach to design. Quote, in our practice, architecture is always about atmosphere. It's about listening to a place, finding the tone and the energy that flows through everything. That is where it begins, end quote. In addition to sheltering the excavations, the parish house contains offices and the council meeting room, which is also used for community gatherings, lectures, film nights, and musical performances. To reach the upper floors, a winding stair with solid dark red handrails coordinates with the triangular space of the main meeting room held within the roof rafters, whose ceiling is also painted in the same crimson hue. Daylight illuminates this dramatic meeting room through irregularly placed skylight windows that are deeply framed by the same handcrafted clay tiles, providing effective shading from the midday sunlight. From an accessible viewing platform, visitors descend to the excavation level via two exposed steel stairs hanging from the structure above and further expression, expressing an atmosphere of preservation and reverence. The designer's material philosophy is one of the that values handcrafted, minimally processed natural materials that retain the traces of their production. For example, each of the clay tiles bears the matrix pattern of the kiln bed, as well as the unique twists and curls produced during the firing and cooling processes. This variety is further enhanced by a range of colors and surface textures. In the same vein, the exposed concrete foundation walls and columns exhibit the striations produced by their horizontal and vertical board formwork. Where these low walls surround the ruins of the refectory, the concrete resembles the horizontality of the long gray bricks of the preserved foundation walls. Another instance of such material gestures are the vertical wide wooden boards that pivot, creating more or less transparency into and shading for the excavation level. These boards have been allowed to slightly warp and twist over time, handcrafted, Curled, warped, and twisted forms and materials are characteristic of the medieval streets of Ripe. In this sense, the interpretation of both form and materials of the parish house situates itself over time with its careful and creative attention to its unique context. Okay, now moving to Australia, we're gonna look at the Sacred Heart Building within the Abbotsford Convent in Melbourne, Melbourne, Victoria, designed by Kirsten Thompson Architects, um, re renovated by Kirsten Thompson Architects. The Abbotsford Convent was established by four nuns from the Order of the Good Shepherd who arrived in Melbourne in 1863 and is built on 16 acres of land in a region that had been inhabited for over 40,000 years by the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. The convent operated for over a hundred years, caring for destitute girls and women, many of whom resided in the Sacred Heart building. While provided with food, shelter, and education, they had to comply with a rigorous schedule of unpaid hard labor in the adjoining commercial Magdalene laundries. Magdalene laundries. Given its role in Australia's social and welfare history, the convent was placed on the National Heritage List in 2017. As expressed by the architect, quote, the Sacred Heart building was a key element within the grounds of a convent and arguably its symbolic heart. The introverted building with its elongated courtyard originally housed many uses of the Magdalene laundry on its ground floor. The upper floors were dedicated to the dormitory and to mending and sewing. The industrial school was on the north end where the young girls learned trade skills. Recently adapted, the Sacred Heart building offers a mix of creative business workshops and learning spaces, as well as venues for cultural events and artisan type retail to generate extra revenue and promote cultural activity and innovation. Due to its heritage protected status, 
the building was required to be conserved throughout the restoration project. Introducing the bare minimum elements to update the building and improve accessibility, including a bridge across a courtyard, two elevator shafts, and a new set of steel stairs, the subtle intervention employs a surgical strategy of mostly subtractive operations. The new bridge expands the circulation by connecting the east and west wings of Sacred Heart, allowing the courtyard to become a relevant part of the experience for artists and visitors above the ground plane and offering a fine vantage point for speeches or performance in the courtyard. Elements removed left marks that remained exposed like scars, continuing to hold memories in the present. When new elements were introduced, the areas of the building in direct contact with them were not refinished, exposing the nature of the original building and keeping a historical record of the new intervention. All additions employed a galvanized steel, clearly distinguishing this layer, this latest layer of change, while satisfying the desire to minimally disturb the original building. The porosity and transparency of the expanded metal decking on the new stairs and walkways allows for a continuity of shared public space on multiple levels, counterbalancing the original isolation of floors. Deep steel plate thresholds intersect the walls to frame new openings and to underline with their thinness the absence of wall rather than the presence of a new gate. Acknowledging and respecting its complex past of juxtaposed aid and hardship, the restoration sought to preserve the building's history as well as to honor the multiple narratives and stories within it. For example, what is now an office space may include what appears as an incongruous remnant of last century's ablution practices, such as a row of basins or a foot bath, potent reminders of its former use. This project embodies the poetics of impermanence as it captures the inevitable changes brought by the aging and weathering of all things. Refined and updated, the architecture also reminds dwellers and the vast community it serves that they are not simply occupying an old structure, but rather a living work of architecture committed to preserving meaningful narratives. Um, now we're moving to Bangladesh, Dhaka. And, um, and we're going to be looking at the Beit Or Roof Mosque by Marina Tabassum Architects. Uh, one note, uh, Negar Goljan um, wrote uh, extensively on this for, in our book. So um, I'm, I've used some of the content in this presentation. Um, it, this, is, um, this mosque is located in a fast growing community of lower income families in Northern Dhaka, Bangladesh. With a modest, modest budget, the architect primarily used unfinished jolly red brick and concrete for the building, which gave rise to its character. Um, it fits within its, its context, yet stands out from its surroundings. Um, and it also is achieved by her subtle but intentional urban site and building design. Designed to address the hot and humid climate, the mosque is a cool and calm place of respite. An attraction for visitors is a de facto magnet for its local community. From the outside, we discover how Tabassum reinvented the mosque as a contemporary architecture based on its traditional Bengal design with an essence of Islam devoid of ritualistic and symbolic attributes. It appears rooted to its place, growing from the semi-open landscape, divided by low brick walls and sheds while surrounded by contemporary concrete housing blocks. It stands out, yet remains unpretentiously content, occupy occupying the space between with a sense of gravitas, belonging, drawing in the community into its quiet contemplative contemplative cool spaces. The mosque is set on a plinth above the street. Um, it's, uh, I'll keep reading. There we go. Um, okay. Creating, there it is, a sacred plane above the city and everyday life. The plinth protects against seasonal flooding, flooding and creates public space for the city. The mosque's colonnade um, facing the street is a liminal space between the outside and the inside as a place to sit, meet, talk, and take shelter from the heat. The site's orientation generated a 13 degree shift between the street and Mecca, the Quibla uh, wall, becoming a key to its unique design. We move from the city and into the, and once into the sacred gathering space, shift to face Mecca. Yet the mosque was designed for community. Its numerous entrances from different uh, directions from its site creates a welcoming space of worship and a um, 
and a social and communal gathering space made comfortable by constant air movement through the building's brick breathing walls, allowing air to fil infiltrate and move through the building. The space is non-hierarchical, without ornament, dome or minarets designed to provide a space for worship, contemplation, and through its simple and elegant design creates an atmosphere of wonder and grace. The mosque is made up of three volumes that create a layered sequence of spaces into the prayer hall a brick outer square parallel to the roll, road into which the brick cylindrical volume it nests and the concrete prayer hall. The interaction between the outer square and the, in, uh, and the cylinder creates four light courses, courts, the colonnade, entrance halls, ablution, light well, and other interstitial spaces between the outer square and the cylinder. Traditional brick construction created the porous brick facade that wraps the prayer wall, uh, hall providing ventilation to the interior. The concrete prayer hall, an open pavilion supported by eight um, columns is set within the cylinder, shifting its axis um, of the square towards Mecca at the Mihra. Light remains the core of the design. The vertical slit and the outer brick wall located on the, um, on the towards Mecca its bright, bright um, light is visible throughout the prayer hall. It filters through the bricks and from the roof, projects star-like pinpricks of light onto the reflective floor of the mosque, implying a sky above and beyond. The bricks, uh, the, the materials, brick, light, and air are the materials that define the sacred spiritual space through an emotive language of architecture created by Tabassum in her pursuit for innovative and contemplative and atmospheres filled with flowing air and changing light. As the architect Lucan wrote, light is material life. At the threshold, the crossing of silence and light lies the sanctuary of art, the only language of man. It is the treasury of the shadows. Whatever is made of light casts a shadow. Our work is of shadow, it belongs to light. And this is the last, press, uh, last uh, uh, project, it's in Tokyo. And um, again, Izumi um, Kuriyoshi um, uh, contributed to this, um, this, this uh, essay in the book. Um, located in Sumida, Sumida War, Tokyo, an area rooted in traditional crafts, the Sumida Hokusai Museum was designed by Kaiuzo Sejima and Associates to allow people to interact and become knowledgeable of local culture. Set near a small park um, in Ryo, Ryoguku, the birthplace of renowned artist Hokusai uh, Kasushika, a master of graphic art in the Edo period, the museum was designed to house and exhibit the work of Hokusai and his disciples. It was designed within an urban, a complex urban fabric bounded by rain, a train tracks, a main road, a child's um, park, and mixed use buildings. Its modern identity and volume contrasting with traditional historic wood architecture maintains a silent expression and familiarity with the quiet yet dense urban atmosphere of the town park and buildings. A monolithic mass, um, a monolithic mass with slip openings, at times the museum appears almost transparent due to its exterior tilted matte wall surfaces that vaguely reflect the surroundings while blending into the sky. Sejima's contextual approach tempers geometric, volumetric, and spatial arrangements with its various programs. The building includes small volumes that join of a single unified open space separated by slits between these volumes to reduce the overall size and mass. The exterior skin is made up of rectangular and polygon aluminum panels, um, each etched and then electro polished with silver aluminite and then precisely joined, tilting either inward or outward over the entire building. Her design recalls Hokusai's unique geometric-based work and its combination of various perspectives within a single work. The museum's tilted exterior walls gather and reveal shimmering reflections of the surrounding park, buildings, and sky. The museum is organized vertically through programmatic volumes whose spaces merge and shift, forming its prismatic and segmented exterior walls. With no discernible entry, one enters the ground floor divided into four spaces through an exterior passage. 
neighborhood commuters. Um, and if you could go to the next one, click the next, I think. Um, neighborhood commuters or visitors can pass by these four spaces surrounded by glass and directly um, connected to the outside. This allows them to cut through the building and out the other side or go directly into the museum. Upon entering, one finds the reception space, library, lecture hall, and circulation core, which links the upper floors of the exhibition spaces. Most walls are slightly tilted, creating comfortable and quiet spaces filled with bright and soft light from the exterior slit William uh, windows. Uh, the contrast between brightness and darkness, closure and release. The public space in the Hokus, um, Hokusai Museum creates immediate intermediate spaces between and within the city's social domain. We look out from the museum to see everyday life occurring around us, all framed by the museum's openings and passages. This establishes a mirror image where the inner and outer spaces penetrate. Between fragmented viewpoints at various angles, the movement of society and people appearing and disappearing. The museum's public spaces are decentralized without logical integration, ultimately conceived from the perspective of pedestrians, but designed by the architect. These shared intermediate regions create an ambiguous sense of distance, reflecting specific features of urbanity and modern Tokyo remaining quietly from Japan's past. The absence of a centralized and united uh, public spaces space reveals a Japanese sense of distance adapting to the surroundings while, while hiding one's ego and existence. This reflects a unique Japanese sensibility through careful craftsmanship of aluminum surface texture, wall surface details, and a subtle blending of the cladding corresponding to Hokusai's geometry as a new expression of public architecture in Japan. We hope you found these nine urban interventions to be interesting and inspiring. And we will ex we expand upon these in our book, which is, will be available in the US in August. Um, and our publisher has generously provided this discount code if you'd like to pre-order a copy from their website. Just take a photo of the, or screenshot of the offer because it's not posted elsewhere. Um, and it's just for those who, who attended um, this lecture. Thank you for your time and attention. And, Hopefully, if there's time um, for questions, um, uh, Maria will help us um, voice them. Thank you. OK, I'm going to take down the slide. So if you okay. had a chance to get a little screenshot. <laughs> you could leave it up if you'd like for a minute while people take a good minute to take it. Okay. Um, we're, we're just about out of time, but truly, inspirational, truly um, wonderful work. And wow, the research that you've all done. I, I've said this before, I can't wait to get this book. Um, we do have, so Thank as you. I, we have wonderful questions in the Q and A and I'm going to just take one, I guess, but I love the last one. Thank you for being such wonderful tour guides. It's amazing. Uh, one armchair chip around the world, but you, you know, um, but, really interesting is because with, with these issues of women things such as the gender pay gap is a question in there how balancing work life and being a mother and an architect and designer what and there's a student concerned or someone concerned about what motherhood looks like um and which one is your most you know which one is your favorite and what did you learn the most so i guess we'll just take one and see how we could answer it. And then we're going to have to conclude, but I'll go with gender pay gaps because it's a it's a big one and it's really critical. So would you say one of the questions is for all, because of the common gender pay gaps, how highly would you recommend women to pursue a master's degree? Would that help? And would you say that helps balance out the gap? Any of you? I can jump in and sure. try to answer it. Um, this We did run across some statistics about uh, the gender pay gaps in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't include that in our book because it would be um, 
kind of geographically specific, right? Even in New York, as opposed to Washington, D.C. or right. here in Scranton. Um, but there is definitely a difference. Um, whether a master's degree helps to balance that, um, well, you generally do get paid a little bit more when you have a master's degree and you're starting in an architecture office. So I think that that does in general get you a little bit of a bump in a pay um, in a pay situation. I would say that you know people are generally a little reticent about sharing their salary information. But if you um, kind of make that a normal thing amongst your colleagues and you can have confidants they might share with you so that you would just know. A lot of times that information is not published unless you work for the government. Okay. <laughs> Oh, if I could add a little bit to that, I, mm -hmm. I think that um, I would, it's a very personal decision and I would encourage everybody to continue to, to develop and, and form and, and study in any way mm -hmm. that is possible. Uh, I wouldn't do it expecting to have a pay raise, but I would say whatever you do that you love will get you always in a much better place. Um, and we are working hard to to solve the 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 pay gap mm -hmm. issue. Uh, we're, you know, there's many um, avenues and and many people going for for um, equality. So I would optimistically think about you know, the, the context changing and just focusing on what you love and do what you love. And if you want to do a master's, by all means, do it. So Marcia, closing thoughts? Um, I, I know that I know that in terms of the uh, pay gap, I think in the UK, um, uh, firms are required to uh, reveal uh, the pay of everyone. So they, so they really show the pay gaps. And I think making it public really exposes the differences. Um, I, I know that um, just like um, every, every other um, profession, there, are, there is a pay gap. Um, and um, and it's, it's really, um, it's hard to, hard to change. Um, mm -hmm. There was a question about PhDs too. Um, um, uh, both mm -hmm. Jody and I have PhDs and I think that um, we, we actually decided to get PhDs even and as, I can't speak for Jody, but I know I did it. I was I was in practice for many years, and then really realized how much I enjoyed uh, teaching and also doing um, research and writing, um, and so I and and thinking um, um, and 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 trying to understand what architecture was about. So that's really how I moved into and worked on my PhD. Mm -hmm. It's right. a very personal decision. <clears throat> yep, great advice from some great, amazing architecture women in front of us here on the screen now authors again and again and <laughs> and i just wish you could see all the the notes going to the chat congratulations amazing work wonderful examples for women in architecture oh, okay. and so this is going to be so inspiring for so many women in the field and expanding oh. the field a great name for our talk and with all of our gratitude from from everyone here at center for the living city the aia northeastern pennsylvania mary Wood school of architecture Please know we are so grateful to all of the hard work that you put into this and just can't wait to get the, the actual physical book and enjoy it in person. And uh, so this concludes our, our lecture for today. And it was a great one. And next one is also going to be super exciting. It's entitled Streets for Everyone. But another series of wonderful folks working on changing our planet here. So Streets for Everyone, April 20th, 6 p.m. Eastern. And you check everything out at the Center for the Living City. This talk will be posted on YouTube very shortly. So you can share it with everyone who missed it and get all the extra um, insight that you added to it. Not often do you get the authors giving you a tour of their book and adding the slides that, that took us around the tour and some extra images in here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.